very enthusiastic. Just go to page four. Okay, agenda item two. Have we any apologies? One from Oliver McMullen. Any other apologies? Oh, just, uh, okay. Agenda item three, Chairperson's Business. Can I advise members that I have accepted an invitation for the Community Development Support Service to speak at the celebratory vision uh, event at the Long Gallery on the 12th of February 2015. Agenda item four, minutes of the meeting, 27th of January 2015. Can I refer members to the draft minutes? The meeting held on the 27th of January 2015 on pages 38 to 42. <coughs> members content that the draft minutes are accurate. Okay. okay. So mm -hmm. I will sign. Okay. Then item 5, Modern Horizon. Can I refer members to Modern Horizon at page 64, 46 to 64. Are members content to action the Modern Horizon as suggested in the index, index sheet, pages 44 and 45? Okay. Then item 6, Correspondence. Can I refer members to the correspondence received at pages 67 to 81? Can I draw your attention to a particular piece of correspondence at page 76 from the Institute of Global Food Security? There's an invitation to the Institute's honour annual lecture on the Thursday of February at 5 p.m. in the Riddle Hall, Queen's University. Uh, should any member wish to attend, in the please advise <coughs> the staff. Are members content uh, to action the rest of the correspondence as suggested in the index sheet on page 66? Okay. Then item 7. We have now uh, an oral briefing from Dard, an update on the second annual progress report on the Rural White Paper. Can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 83 to 85, and the annual progress report from the department at pages 87 to 183. Can I welcome Colette McMaster, Assistant Secretary, and Niall Heaney, Principal Officer. Can I ask you both, you say you're very welcome, can I ask you to take up to 10 minutes uh, for your presentation, and then we'll ask questions. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members, for the opportunity to make this presentation regarding the second annual progress report on the Rural White Paper Action Plan. Um, I have with me Niall Heaney, who is the policy lead for DARD Rural Policy Initiatives, including the Rural White Paper Action Plan. The annual progress report 2014 was published on the DARD website in December, in line with the monitoring arrangements agreed for the Rural White Paper Action Plan and the targets set in DARD's business plan. The Rural White Paper Action Plan is an executive initiative led by the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, which aims to identify and address key issues and challenges facing rural communities. It was approved by the executive in May 2012 and formally launched by the DARD Minister in June 2012. The Rural White Paper Action Plan sets out the Executive's vision for rural areas and contains commitments made by all departments in support of achieving that vision and to help ensure the future sustainability of rural areas. The Action Plan provides a framework for a more integrated approach for the Executive to address the challenges affecting rural areas. It recognises that issues affecting rural areas cut across the remit of all government departments. Responsibility for delivering the actions contained in the action plan lies with the respective lead department and DARD has the role of monitoring the implementation of the action plan. The monitoring arrangements set out in the plan provide for departments to report back to DARD through the Interdepartmental <coughs> Committee on Rural Policy, the IDCRP, on the progress made in implementing their commitments and for DARD to publish an annual report and progress on its website. The IDCRP is an interdepartmental committee made up of senior civil servants from all government departments and it is chaired by the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. The IDCRP was responsible for overseeing the development of the action plan and has a key role to play in monitoring its impl implementation. In May 2014, the IDCRP met to discuss progress on implementing the Rural White Paper Action Plan and agreed the format for the annual progress report, which is similar to the um, previous year for 2013. The second annual progress report 2014, published on the 18th of December, details the progress made by departments in implementing their commitments in the Rural White Paper Action Plan during the period since it was first launched in June 2012 up until 30th of June 2014. 
Dowd has a number of wide-ranging commitments in the Rural White Paper Action Plan and has made good progress in taking these forward. Over the reporting period, significant progress has been made across the range of actions, including the work on cap reform, working with other departments to develop the executive response to the Agri-Food Strategy Board Strategic Action Plan going for growth, developing the Rural Development Programme 2014-2020 and advancing relocation plans. A key development in the reporting period has been the appointment of a rural statistician by Dard, who has been working on a range of rural policy issues, including the collation of statistics from across government. The first set of rural-urban comparative statistics was made available on the Dard website in autumn 2014 and will be used to enhance the evidence base to support rural development policy. The system of settlement classification is currently subject to review by a cross-departmental working group led by NISRA. The rural statistician represents DARD on this group, which is expected, expected to publish its findings later this year. It is envisaged that the work undertaken by the rural statistician and other planned rural research will contribute to better policy outcomes for rural dwellers through a greater focus on evidence-informed rural policy making and an increased knowledge and understanding of rural issues. In addition, DARD has been progressing a number of joint initiatives with other departments as part of the PFG commitment to bring forward a package of measures to tackle rural poverty and social isolation. A total of £11.5 million has been spent in the period up to June 2014 under a diverse range of measures. These measures are delivered in partnership with other organisations. The aim is to complement other poverty and isolation initiatives and actions undertaken by government. For example, during the period of the 2014 report, DARD has continued to support the delivery of the Maximising Access Rural Areas MARA project in conjunction with the Public Health Agency. The MARA project aims to improve the health and well-being of people living in rural areas by increasing access to services, grants and benefits, and by facilitating a coordinated service to support rural dwellers living in or at risk of poverty and social isolation. The annual progress report includes a number of case studies which demonstrate the positive impact this programme has had on the lives of rural people. DARD has also continued to support the Assisted Rural Travel Scheme, ARTS, a joint initiative between DARD and DRD, which aims to address the issue of access to transport services in rural areas. Under the ARTS initiative, Smart Pass holders over, for over 60s and disabled people in rural areas can avail of free and concessionary half fare transport via the Rural Community Transport Partnership Services. This scheme has been very popular, with over 630,000 trips having been funded up to the 30th of June 2014. Dard's also been doing work with DECAL and Libraries NI with a view to raising the profile of libraries in rural areas. A range of projects have been developed, including the Library in a Box initiative which aims to improve access to books and reading in rural areas. DARD is also working in partnership with a range of organisations, including Libraries NI, to extend the Health in Mind initiative in rural areas. Health in Mind is a library programme which aims to raise awareness of positive mental health and increase understanding of mental health issues through reading, learning and information sharing. And finally, um, the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development has made a commitment to strengthen rural proofing across government and, as the committee is aware, DARD has commenced the process of developing proposals for a rural proofing bill to be progressed within the current Assembly mandate, subject to executive approval. The proposed bill will require the needs of rural dwellers and the impacts on rural communities to be identified and appropriately addressed in the development and delivery of policy and public services. The Minister has today launched a public consultation on the proposals and officials will be holding a series of public meetings throughout the six-week consultation period. DARD has also continued to support other government departments in implementing rural proofing through the provision of advice, guidance and training. The Minister has made it clear she sees the Rural White Paper Action Plan as a live initiative which continues to respond to the needs of rural communities and delivers meaningful outcomes for rural dwellers. She has asked her executive colleagues to identify within their departments new and challenging actions for inclusion in a refreshed action plan to be published during 2015. Departments have indicated that uncertainty over budgets has impacted on their ability to commit to new actions. 
Now that the budget situation has been clarified, officials propose to meet with members of the IDCRP over the next few weeks to encourage departments to revisit this issue with a view to identifying further new actions. We also plan to continue to engage with rural stakeholders on the refresh of the Rural White Paper Action Plan through the stakeholder group that will be considering the Rural Proofing Bill proposals. DARD will continue to monitor progress by departments on implementing the Rural White Paper Action Plan. It is intended to produce the next annual progress report by 31st of December 2015 in respect of the progra progress made by departments up to 30th of June 2015. And thank you. Um, happy to take questions and comments on the annual report. Thank you very much. Uh, glad for your presentation. In your opinion, how is the whole process of the rural white paper bedding down? Do you think exactly encouraging other departments to understand the design of rural <coughs> white I think, um, well, certainly there's, uh, it's, you know, the Minister sees it as a live initiative and um, it is something, um, I think, the, the sort of process of, of engaging with departments and of them inputting and reporting progress and so on, it is, um, it is something that is helping to bed the sort of approach in. Um, in terms of the actual actions, um, there is good progress being reported um, on the actions that are contained within the plan by, um, and you'll, you'll see that by, by looking through the, the annual report, a number of case studies there actually evidencing um, very good progress in terms of the um, in terms of the work being done in rural areas and rural communities and, uh, and the actual results that are being achieved by that. So, um, Yes, to date, and this is just the second second year of reporting, good progress being made. As I said, the Minister does see it as a live initiative and wants to, wants it to remain very um, refreshed, if you like. So it's something that, that we are coming back to and are going to be engaging now over the next weeks with departments again to see if we can um, get um, further and refreshed input into the action plan for, for this next year. Okay. Declan McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, Colette, you made reference there a while ago to the settlement classification review, um, and which should be concluded later. <coughs> um, I'm just uh, wondering, obviously, I'm presuming that the settlement classification could have an application of whether different settlements are eligible or otherwise to be uh, get funding from the Rural Development Programme. What, will, will, the, will, this have, will this impact on them, you know? Um, well, I think uh, certainly the, the rural development program that we've uh, the current program the um, we have applied the, the default the current default classif classification in terms of the program, which is uh, um, rural settlements are considered to be populations below four thousand five hundred, um, and certainly in, in putting the draft program forward, we're, we're continuing to work on yeah. that basis. Um, so we'll we'll wait and see what the um, what the the next results of the the review are. Um, I would anticipate that um, what will emerge from the re from the review, if there is a, a recommendation for a change at all, um, there be a recommendation for a default, but again with some flexibility yeah. provided, so that where it is appropriate and their departments would be required to show a rationale as to why they would. Mm. Um, divert from the default, but that there would be opportunity to, to apply a slightly different approach if that was appropriate in the circumstances. Um, yeah. Do you now do you have anything? No, I think we've used the default position of four and a half thousand, but that doesn't stop other departments actually giving a good rationale to try and funding below that threshold or above it. It's just we'd be concerned in case there was a gap. Yeah. Say some departments did ten thousand, we did four and a half, and there was that yeah. settlement size in between. So we're trying to stop that and Look at four and a half thousand as a default, but that doesn't stop interventions and in other settlements. Mm -hmm. And looking at the flexibility within the programme, to make sure no one loses out. Yeah, and thank you. And chair, one of the you made reference there to the Lamar programme, and I think there's people representing rural areas. We know how successful it has been. Um, I'm wondering what what is uh, your intention in uh, respect to the Lamar programme going forward. Well, the Mara program is a program that DARDS um, engage jointly um, with the uh, through DHSS. Um, so it's an action led by DHSS um, with DARD contributing to that. 
and um, you're right, it's been very, um, very successful programme. You know, just looking to date the lifetime of this PFG, there's um, 13,287 households have been visited under the Mara project. Yeah. So um, very successful. It's uh, something that the Department of Health are, are reporting on, as, as well as ourselves, because of the, the engagement of their department. Um, and going forward with any any of these actions, would certainly be encouraging departments to look at the you know to look at the impact of the existing actions, and um, where there is um, where there is good impact, you know, encouraging people to sort of to, if there if there's a need and a gap to to consider that continuing with that in the future, um, ideally, and obviously this comes down to resourcing and so on in the end, but in in, in the end, it's sort of to help decisions about mm. what's the best way to, to use resources and so on. Um, and part of part of doing that will be, as ministers, encouraging people to use rural proofing, sort of consider what the impact, um, potential impact is in rural areas of, of decisions about um, how resources will be used in the future before making those decisions. D just to ask in Niall if he's anything further on the No, on just saying, Mara started off as a pilot project to actually look and see, to test the market, so to speak, to see if there was a need. And actually, clearly demonstrates there is a need in the real areas. So it's worked quite well from that point of view. Working with the PHA and DHSS, and this has also shown that they are very keen to actually fill that need. So I can't see it being shut down, but it is just a matter of looking at the resources and how we move on to see. Because obviously, people will continually fall into this here, Mara program. Mm -hmm. so it's just seems done so much work at the minute. It's a matter of recapping, looking what we've done, and seeing if there's any other areas of intervention needs to be done. And then, ideally, we'd like to see it mainstreamed as part of government policy. I would say health taking it forward then, but that's a fight we'll have to have with health then moving forward. Just the final point, Chair, thank you for your indulgence. I think when we got the briefing here from the Mara the, and the Mara project there in recent months, um, we were impressed at the, the level of data that was gathered in the course of carrying out all of the visits, and we sort of agreed on the importance of that information being used and shared across departments to help pinpoint people who are in need maybe to inform. Uh, decision making, you know, across departments, you know, because there's such a rich source of information there, uh, which which should be used right across the board, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's that's important as we're, we're sort of departments are building evidence and information about the mm. need in rural areas and how's that being addressed. It, it's um, it, it, that is that's something we would encourage is sort of to integrate that sort of knowledge and information. Yeah, and rural statisticians taking some of that information as well and looking to build up their rural evidence base on the website. Mm -hmm. That'll factor into that work as well. Sounds good. Thanks, Chair. Okay, good morning. Thanks, oh. Chairman. In relation to you know, the second annual report. Is DARE coordinating or are they leading on the innovations between departments? Um, okay, so we're coordinating or leading on the, sorry, just to your last week, part of your question there. Are you coordinating or leading on the innovation between departments? Um, we're, well, we have, um, with the two roles in there really, in DARD, um, I suppose we have actions ourselves in there to deliver on the, on the Real White Paper Action Plan. So we're working, um, a number of those actions are, are actions that we're engaged in working with other departments to deliver on. Um, but we're also, because um, Minister of Agriculture, Rural Development is leading on the Real White Paper Action Plan initiative um, in the executive. Um, Bard has the um, has the role in actually Leading on the um, monitoring and reporting on the uh, the progress of the action plan, so I suppose there's that dual role there. Um, we're involved in it as well, and then delivering and com and delivering on the commitments we've made, and we have that additional role in leading and monitoring. Chairman, well, if we take the second annual report, what are the new innovation projects? That have been developed that year that hadn't been there previous. Um, well, I suppose for um, for Dard, probably the, the sorts of um, areas that you mentioned, which was the rural statistician. I mean, um, the the launch of the the rural statistics website in Dard is is a, a new development certainly in this year. That's probably launched just after the at the end of this period that we're looking at, um, but. 
uh, DART engaged the statistician during that period, and the results of that have led to the, the launch of the new Rural Statistics website. From our point of view, that's a sort of significant one in terms of um, building that uh, database of statistics and evidence that all departments can draw on to provide evidence to them and helping them to make their, their decisions. It is a great job telling its significance, Colette. But it's a fairly modest achievement in one year of finding a statistician. No, it's really the outcome, I suppose, and, and the, sort of the usefulness that, that that information can provide across departments, you know, not just within our own. Um, but there, there's, there's a number of um, what are other... The, well, can I ask, what's the key priorities to develop new projects for the next year? Have they been set yet? Well, yes, departments have been... Um, departments have been asked to um, look at the actions that they are already committed to in the action plan and to um, consider new and challenging actions to include in the future action plan. So each department is being asked to do that, um, including our own, obviously. So DARD will be doing that, but equally all departments have been asked to do that. So um, that process has started. Um, it'll be very much down to departments themselves to determine what for them is a, a challenging um, new action for inclusion. Um, departments will have to look at those decisions in terms of resourcing because they will have to resource that from within their own budgets. Um, but certainly it's a process that the DARD is, has to work through as well. So um, the contributions to the new action plan will be um, actions signed off at ministerial level within the departments. So it's not it's so much DARD determining what actions others will have, but each department coming forward with the actions for inclusion. So we're depending on new and challenging projects to emanate from each of the individual departments. That begs the question, are DARD leading or coordinating? And is there going to be a statutory basis for which the rural briefing is going to be put on to a legislative basis? Yeah, I suppose in, in this, we're we're leading on this, but it's a coordinating role in terms of asking other departments to come forward with their their new actions. Now, that is something the Minister has decided she wanted to do this year. Um, you know, the Real White Paper Action Plan itself, um, when it was launched by the Executive, um, was launched with a view to reviewing it after a period of five years. But the Minister herself wants, wanted to go out this year to seek this... Um, Include, you know, include, she asked departments and ministers to bring forward new and challenging ac actions. So that's that's one thing that's happening now. There is there isn't a statutory basis for the Real White Paper Action Plan. Um, it's an executive commitment, um, and all departments are committed to uh, delivering on the commitments that are in that and considering that. But what we, the minister is is doing is bringing forward proposals for a real proofing bill which um, will put, would put a duty on departments um, to consider the impacts of any potential policy or service in a rural area and to take those into account before making decisions about the future policies and services. So um, that, in its, that, in effect, will, will help, we believe, to enhance and strengthen the rural proofing approach in terms of what actions come through in a rural white paper action plan in future. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Sydney okay. Anderson. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Colette and Neil, for your, for your presentation. Just to continue on the, on the theme of the, the rural statistician, it uh, seems very good, but you know, we all do whatever. Um, move around statistics to, to suit different things or what we want to read into them. Uh, can, can, you, can you expand in some way? I see here that the, the work of the statistician was to report back, was that in autumn of 2014 there? Uh, what we see coming out of that, that may be something useful and important going forward in the short term to, to address the, the, the great issues that we have in the rural communities, in relation to many, many uh, set issues, and something that the Rural uh, White Paper Action Plan has to address going forward, if we are to, to really 
help the rural dwellers uh, in, in a better quality of life and services and whatever. So is there anything that's jumping out initially here from the statistics uh, from the first, I think this is the first set of statistics that we have got here in the autumn time. We'll see, do we? Yep. We'll see a statistician, there's quite a lot of information, Cal, in public domain, but the data that we have at the minute covers people in households, income and poverty, economy and labour market, health, education, crime, housing, transport and quality of life. There's differences and similarities between urban and rural, and there's also, we've got similarities in urban, mixed with rural, and then urban east and urban west, and rural east and rural west to try and do a comparator to see if there's any specific issues in certain rural areas, because you can't just compare urban and rural. Like, like, and then there's one for the Belfast metropolitan area. Some of the big things jumping out, as you would expect, would be access to transport, especially in the rural west. It can out as an issue. Some of the things would be health care. But some of the things that's actually quite positive is education. The team at New Realize is seen to be better. And that's been demonstrated in the statistics up until 16-year-olds at the school evening age. Some of that's quite good. This is actually gathered from a lot of other government departments and from this website. So some we can stand over and actually go to other departments and say, the statistics show us here. We should actually look at any intervention needed. Because some of the interventions could be about post-school education that we wouldn't have responsibility for. But at least we can use these statistics to actually go to other departments with an evidence base to actually start a discussion about what interventions we could look at in real areas, such as third level education, such as having a, a discussion with DRD on transport provision to hospital care in certain areas of the West. So it's quite good from that point of view. And it's quite good that actually our stakeholders have access to this information they can use as well. And with people. So we've, we think it's a quite, quite a good resource. It also helps us with our tackling rural poverty and isolation. At the end, we can actually look and see where we should focus our spend in future. Yeah, but when we get all those acts and figures, how can we get the departments to come together to action? What, what's probably good, uh, good facts, uh, and they're telling us a lot. But it's putting those. It's putting them into practice. Put them into practice. To, I think uh, anyone that's lived in the rural area or has knowledge of the rural area knows only too well the issues out there. And you know, it's a massive issue in relation to. Well, who's going to fund this, and how does this all yes. going to be brought together? Uh, we we can talk uh, all we want and around the issues, and we can produce all the reports and stats and they all look good and we know what has to be done, but at the end of the day, how can we put this into practice? I don't think you're, you're touching on it. Well, see, an example is DRD are looking at integrated transport provision, and we were working with them on that there, and they're looking at, they're doing a pilot in Dungannon. So they're bringing through all the transport providers from health, education, community transport, rural stakeholders at the table as well. So it's looking at how we can actually use what government resources are there from all the transport providers and actually integrate it and make it better and actually make it applicable to a rural setting. So there's things out there now using the rural context as well to identify what the specific needs are. So there's things out in practice that's actually working. And I don't think without the development of the white paper and the rural proofing that we would have actually got that. I think they would have they just looked at as a transport vision. We might have to cut it on a broad brush approach now they're looking at the specific needs of rural dwellers to see. We might have to tailor transport vision there. And it might be best of looking what transport do we have there. It's not just Ulster bus Fleet, there's the education library board buses, there's the healthcare buses. So it's looking at them and, and the community fleet to see how can we actually best use this and see where people travel to and make it applicable to a rural setting and meet the needs of all rural dwellers. So you can see some, it's, it's very, very difficult work. It's a very, very good project they're doing, but they're piloting in Dungannon and Cookstown area to sort of start looking to see what the difficulties are and try and iron them out. And then there's difficulties around licensing and stuff come into it as well. But it's probably for the first time we've even tried to do something like this here. Because we keep hearing that there's an education fleet that's not being used after the morning and the evening school runs, and it's sitting idle all day. But there's, there's other issues involved in that, such as paying drivers on a part-time basis. So they're looking at this comprehensively and actually trying to tailor to meet the needs of rural dwellers. So I think that's actually quite a worthwhile project. I think if anything's happened now, I, I, I know this last number of years has been to reduce services and to do away with a lot of rural... Uh, 
Yeah, and like we're the concern that they would cut yeah. rural provisions. So we're yeah, trying to work with. You're touching there on rural libraries first out. Like what has happened to rural libraries and, and villages and everywhere else? And I and other members have had to face this where they're being closed down, things like that. So what we're talking about here is a member bringing yeah. some element of the library to the community. That's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, we've we we worked with rural libraries quite a lot, and in recent times, of, although they are facing massive reductions, they're not closing any more rural libraries. They are actually reducing ours, but they're happy to work with ours and especially work with the farming community at certain peak times of year when you have a single farm payment. Taxi tailor package to actually help them through that because you've got your fast broadband in all the libraries. So there's, there's things we can do to work a bit more flexibly. We're working with Levy's and I on these sort of initiatives. And you get the broadband side, you just touched on it there. Well, see, we can't sort it for but but all the libraries have confirmed they have yeah. super fast broadband and the people actually can help yeah. farmers navigate the sites, which is also a bit of a it's, uh, it's, a, it's a massive, uh, it's a massive. But it's a huge issue. Uh, huge, and certainly I wish you well and whatever does come out of this, but. Uh, I suppose anything's better than nothing if we, we have to make a start somewhere. We'll keep, if we keep it in the agenda, yes. at least to yes. take account of it. Yeah, and keep trying to move it forward, Joe. So. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, there's substantial overlap uh, with the railroad paper and the Tipsy uh, framework. Do we need both? Well, I suppose the, um, the Rail White Paper Action Plan is includes initiatives by all departments. And the TRIPSI um, is a DARD framework initiative. So it's certainly part of all of those actions, but there's the Real White Paper Action Plan is a lot a lot broader actions right across government in there that go beyond the TRIPSI, I suppose. So um, there is quite a lot of I think particularly from the you know, DARD tackling rural poverty and social isolation framework, there are a lot of the actions that fit very well under the Rural White Paper Action Plan because uh, they are sort of uh, a lot of ac actions where we're collaborating with other departments jointly and so on, um, which is part of the aim of the Rural White Paper Action Plan. But yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot more actions in there um, across other departments as well as our own in, yeah. in the Rural White Paper Action Plan. So it's, it's one part of it, I suppose. Okay, do you option? Thank you, Chair. Apologies for missing your briefing, so my question may already ha have been covered. Um, I would like to focus on the Mara project for a moment, if I may. And I think it is hard to read the case studies and see the success this project is having on the ground. So um, you, you may already have covered, but is it Stard's intention to fund the project to 2016? Where is the feature of the, the project? Could you maybe outline that? Um, well, I think we, we talked about we did talk about that um, in terms of the, the sort of ongoing. I mean, a lot of the, the 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 work that was started here was started as sort of pilot work or as rolled out from there in terms of um, the impacts. And there's been very good impacts from the Mara project. Um, I think what what we're saying is any any decisions about future funding certainly um, we would. We, from, we would be encouraging all departments to look at the impacts that the, the sort of projects have had and, uh, and considering how they would use funding in future. Um, one of the, the, other, the other things that came up in the discussion earlier was in terms of identifying what other gaps there might be out there as well. So um, ideally, we'd, we'd like um, anything good that has emerged out of the Real White Paper Action Plan to be, to be mainstreamed and for you know, dep across departments and for departments to be able to take that forward. Um, obviously, all of that's subject to resource decisions, but um, we'd, we'd like to see that, having some, something started that was good in the Real White Paper Action Plan, but also important to look at where, where there might be other gaps, that where there, there may be further work needed or new work. When you say a uh, across departments, I note that the business case from the PHA has been approved and funding has been secured for 14-15. So w when will we hear about the funding for this up to 2016? Um, the funding in 15-16. For the Did, project? Yeah. Um, I think, well, going beyond, um, I, I'm not aware that there is a question over the funding in 1516. Mm -hmm. So it's not in any doubt is secure then, is that what you're saying? Um, 1516, the funding is in place for trips that you think beyond that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, going forward when you have a successful project and benefits mm -hmm. have been shown, you know, obviously it would be, I'd like to hear more about the security going forward and you talk about cross departments and mm -hmm. the PHA 
has their funding in place for 2014 15 yeah. going forward across departmentally for so is the funding in place categorically then because is your, your intention to, to fund the project up to 2016 um well the, there's an action plan the action plan in place currently there's 14 15 that the funding for 15 16 decisions are, are taken now for 15 16 going beyond that will be um if there isn't already, well, going beyond that is the next um, budget period. So there would be funding that's, I'm not sure how that will work through, but um, departments will be bidding in the next budget process for, for the, the budget period beyond 15-16. Um, anticipate that will be happening just you, in this coming year. You have secured the funding going forward for the Mara, Mara project, then you don't see any issues with that um, coming down the line? I, I think for, I think decisions beyond this budget period will be subject to the budget process that's going forward beyond 1516. Um, but I can we talk about our own. Um, we, we, don't, we don't hold the budget for Marat and all our division within DARD, but I think TRIPC, we've secured additional budget up to mm -hmm. 2016, and Mara is part of one of our TRIPC programs. Do you, don't see the, do you see there being an issue, or are you don't confident see any, any that it will be carried issue. forward? You don't, don't see any issue with Mara. After 2016, we went to a new comprehensive enemy view. That's a different level. For every time, but I think up to 2016. It was just Clef was speaking about pilot schemes and different things forward, and it is important that you know, that security is given the fact of the success that people, there's been with it, that people can see that it is going to be rolled out going forward. Maybe it could be updated, Chair, then in due course. With, with yeah, I would have thought you can't uh, go forward further than 16 because there'll be a new Monday yeah. at the NDC, so yeah. you, you can't. Mm -hmm. I would have thought. 2016 would There's end no up. There's no issues up until 2016. Yeah, sure. I'm not aware of any issue. Okay. Okay. I'm not, I'm right. not aware. So it's secured up to 2016. 15, 16. 16. Yeah, it's secured up to them. That's my understanding. I'm not aware of anything else. If there's anything else, could then we, let, we will let you know. Could you just clarify yeah. that yes. for me? That yes. up to that point, I understand yeah. the new yeah. mandate in 2016, yeah. but mm -hmm. it's clarity up to that point. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Tom again. Yeah, and again, apologies for being late in missing your presentation, but I do note uh, the rural white paper and rural proofing and all are something that, uh, especially rural proofing coming from rural area, is something I'm very keen on to, to see and to ensure that, well, the, 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 the needs of the people in the rural area and all those things are, are protected and kept, if at, if at all possible. I notice one of the things that, that the department has been doing was setting up a walking group to look at the whole issue of the community use of schools and all that type of thing. And there was guidance that was uh, issued last January, January 2014. Have you any update or can you tell us anything on how that work is ongoing between that group that was set up and the schools and trying to get more of a community involvement uh, in the schools? We know that the numbers numbers times in the rural schools fluctuate, they go up and down for a while, and it's when the numbers are down if we want to be real about rural proofing and trying to keep our rural schools, that's when we need the greater community involvement in order for to try and to keep and to maintain that until the numbers increase again. Especially, you know, I'm just wondering what, how that has developed, how that has been taken forward. Okay. Um, I'm think, wondering, is that was one, are you referring to one that's a particular working group that was established under Department of Education? Yeah. Yep. Okay, 31. And that's section 31 in here in the, perhaps, um, the Extended Schools Programme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Department of Education are, um, and what they have said to us in, the, in their update on that is, um, they will be encouraging school owners and promoters through the publication of a guidance document to prior to that targeted increasing community use of schools facilities to seek opportunities <coughs> to provide out of hours opportunities for the use of the wide range of facilities available in schools for the benefit of children and the wider community. Um, I am I haven't got with me anything further on that particular initiative. No, I'm not no, sure whether you we don't have anything further, but we would be keen to support that yeah. initiative. And I think we were told that development of the white paper, that it was up to individual principals at the school to yeah. decide how to use the school building, because there was a lot of insurance to police, but none that are unsurpassable. And I think it's probably a better use rather than building another community centre, community hall, 
the facilities there and you can actually make the best use of. Yeah. So we'll be speaking to DE as part of identifying new actions moving forward and we can raise that yeah. with them again. What's the department taking the lead in the rural white paper then? You know, there, there has to be communication with the different departments uh, within the rural white paper, surely, as to how things have been taken forward, oh, yes, how they're progressing, the how the targets have been met, and all that type of thing. Uh, does DARD not have play that type of a role since they are, are the lead, if you like, in the rural white paper? Like a challenge role, do you mean? Yeah. No, we have a role for coordinating the actions because it's up to each individual department with policy responsibility for the actions to contribute to them because all these actions are agreed at ministerial level from their individual ministers. Okay. We, we will support that and we would actually speak to them about yeah. whether that action because it's one we've raised with them in the past. What we, would, what we would be encouraging them to do and I think, and this is, this is any department, is that in making decisions and we'll be talking to officials from departments over the next weeks about the refreshed action plan be encouraging them to um, to consider, you know, to rule proofing in terms of their decisions about yeah. what they will be uh, doing in future and what they'll be taking forward. So that'll be a discussion we'll be having with them over the next next weeks. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. I think um, joined up uh, government is very, very important. I think that is an issue of just looking at renewable energy here. Uh, and the fact that, that you know, planning services work hard uh, to achieve that, but we have a situation whereby, and I have someone just recently this week, um, gets an approval for a wind turbine, but the difficulty then is uh, NIE and Northern Ireland Electricity uh, are tell well, they've already given them a quote, but they won't tell them for it to be one year, two years, or three years before they can get a connection. So those sort of things are really stifling. Progress and the fact that there's, there's a real push to help in one regard, and then they go on to the next, mm -hmm. and they're, 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 they're totally stifled and can't move. Mm -hmm. So there are issues. Um, and if that also asks all the questions, I think for now. So thank you very much for your thank presentation. You. Thank you. Okay. Agenda, agenda item 8 of the Forward Work Programme. Can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 185 and the Forward Work Programme at pages 186 to 190. Members may recall that the committee did have a potential gap in the work programme at the for the 3rd of March. Subsequently, the committee has since received a request from the recently formed TB Strategy Group to brief the committee and close session on the recent TB consultation. Members content with that request? Okay. Members? All right. I ask members to note that Professor Chris Elliott has indicated that he would be available to come to the committee to discuss the work of the Institute for Global Food Security on the 10th of March 2015. Members content for this briefing to be scheduled. Okay. Can I advise members that the Department of RC requested to defer the briefing on the Farm Business Improvement Scheme scheduled for the 10th of February to the 3rd of March 2015. The Department advises that it is still working on the details of the scheme. And would be better in a, in a better position on the 3rd of March to fully update the committee. Are the members content? Okay, members. Following the informal meeting with the Joint Committee on Agriculture, Food and the Marine last week, a return visit to the, the Oroctus uh, was discussed. Would members be content to schedule a visit in late September 2015? Yeah. Okay. Members will recall that it was agreed to schedule a visit to the Groceries Code Adjudicator in late May and combine this with a meeting with the sponsoring minister at Westminster. However, Westminster is likely to be in the aftermath of an election and there may or may not be a sponsoring minister at that stage. And if there is, um, they are likely to be very recently appointed. An appointment may not at that stage be secured. We would try to meet with the British Retail Consortium as well as the Groceries Code Adjudicator. Would members prefer to go ahead with the visit and see the Groceries Code Adjudicator on the British Retail Consortium, but not the Sponsoring Minister, or defer the visit to the autumn 2015? Can I, can I uh, seek the opinion of members? 
or which option do we prefer on that issue? I think John might have been better to wait and see the minister over there. Could be a better option. But I think there is a question of whether there will be a legislative change to the rule of the, uh, the groceries that you get as well. But given her some teeth, remember we said at the time? Yeah, that's right. The toothless tiger. That's right. So, I mean, <coughs> unless she's given some teeth, that's not going to happen. It's going to be effective. Do you want to? Do you want to still? <laughs> not a fee thing. <laughs> I still have my own chair. <laughs> I'm not afraid of you, some chair. <laughs> Can we take an agreement for the forward work programme? Okay. Agreed. 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 Any other business? Any other business? Going into closed session just now. So. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that then. Mm -hmm. yeah, Agenda item 11, or briefing, raise briefing on food animal traceability systems. Can I refer members to the research paper from the committee researcher? Uh, page 3 of the table papers. Uh, can I welcome Mark Allen, uh, our summary researcher? And uh, Mark, um, look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I suppose, first off, can I apologise for the fact that this table was papered, but our we <laughs> arranged that. <laughs> paper was tabled. I think you need new tables. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's getting to be. Uh, apologies, but just in terms of uh, last week, I was in, in Brussels for a couple of days and just ran a bit tight for, for time to get things done. So um, I very much, I suppose, plan to, to go through this. Um, I'm quite happy to take questions. Um, and I suppose I also have to say, given the time pressure on it, I mean, the paper it was never designed to be anyway, but it is not comprehensive. It's designed to give you an overview of, of what is really a, 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 a very complex issue. I maybe wasn't quite aware of how complex it was until I began to look at it. Uh, I suppose just to start off, um, the context, as you're well aware of, I suppose that obviously the department uh, came in and bringing forward its proposals for the replacement of APHIS with, with, with NIFIS. And I suppose the, the context for that really, um, and the background to animal identification traceability systems really goes back, I suppose, to a lot of us, as many things do in, in this field, to European legislation. And I suppose really a, a lot of the, the, the legislation that we're dealing with, and I pick a couple of instruments out there within the actual paper, I suppose really owed their origins really to mad cow disease outbreak um, across Europe. Um, I suppose they, in, the, in the late 90s, I mean, the specific I suppose, reference that I really make there is, is uh, Council Regulation 1760-2000 in the year 2000 for obvious reasons, which I suppose really set out the requirements for those keeping cattle. And I suppose I want to emphasise at this point that the majority of these systems really have their motivation, their primacy around cattle. Um, that directive or regulation, I suppose, really led to, to requirements for all EU member states, as I said, to have cattle identification registration systems, and those also had to have the following elements. Ear tags to identify animals individually, computerised databases, animal passports, and individual registers on, on each holding. So with that in mind, uh, what I have tried to reflect in is, is where we could find comparable data. And I suppose we were able to find uh, data from seven jurisdictions, including Northern Ireland. So there's a, the table that you can see within your paper has obviously the IFAS uh, features uh, when it was introduced, some of the costing information on it as well. And I suppose really we were stuck on a bit there too in relation to NIFAS and the, the review or the early updates plan. The other territories that you have data within the table from are GB, and that's what I focused on really there is the cattle tracing service. From the Republic of Ireland, where you have the Animal Identification and Movement System, or AIM. And then Botswana, uh, we picked up as well because we were able to get documentation around that, and that's this Livestock Identification and Traceability System. And then we go, I suppose, really uh, to Australia with the National Livestock Identification System, Canada with the Canadian Livestock Tracking System, and finally New Zealand with the National Animal Identification and Tracing System. Um, I don't intend to go through maybe in great detail the table I said I'm happy to take questions on it but it might be something that you may want to peruse maybe over more time on it but what I did do I suppose and there might be some merit on it and I've built upon is maybe make a couple of key observations and maybe highlight maybe some particular questions that could be pertinent in relation to these systems. The first one maybe to emphasise something I've already said is that, that cattle are really the key 
species driving the creation, maintenance and development of these systems. Um, and that's, I suppose, reflected in the fact that some countries only appear to operate traceability and identification systems for cattle, or have chosen to develop these systems for other species, haven't originally established it for cattle. I mean, Botswana being a good example where the majority of their, their beef is exported to Europe. That system and the documentation we have, while it could be applied to other animals, is primarily focused on cattle because it's their export product. I suppose the other thing is, as well, and uh, it builds upon something that we, we touched upon already, is that whilst EU regulations have directly influenced the development of many of these systems, and I have to say not just of EU member states, due really to the need to ensure access to the EU market. Some systems appear to meet the minimum EU requirements while others exceed them. Um, now that's obviously, maybe countries outside the EU are maybe more likely just to simply to reach in some instances a minimum threshold, but there can equally be instances, uh, as you can see in the table, where countries that could be argued have exceeded what was required, maybe through adding animal disease data or whatever. I suppose that does raise the question as whether those countries exceed uh, the minimum requirements as a result of direct design, or is it maybe which um, we suspect, I suppose when looking at a lot of data, is it the fact that there were systems which predated the EU regulations to which elements required to meet the EU regulation were bolted on so that you maybe expand an existing system rather than creating a dedicated system to deal with the requirements from the EU. I have to say at this point to you, in general terms, it is hard to directly compare animal identification and traceability systems due to the fact that the, the systems, on the, the basis of what we, the information we looked at, tend to be tailored to meet the specific needs of the agricultural industry operating within the particular region or country. Looking at our own, I suppose, compared to the other nations that I, I covered and, and uh, uh, jurisdictions, APHIS does seem to be quite unique on the limited sample we've looked at. For the, and I really say that, I suppose, in terms of the range of the data that it holds um, and how it's actually utilised. It's interesting, for example, in terms of animal health data, in particular, and disease data and disease status. In a number of the other countries, that's held in separate uh, databases. I suppose Northern Ireland is, is quite, and the IFA system appears, it doesn't seem to be the same um, catch-all system which has all of that data and that does raise the question in the other countries and jurisdictions as to whether the data that they do have on animal disease and animal disease status is compatible with the traceability and identification systems that they operate and that is one of the actual challenges which was picked up in some of the documentation. It has to be said another um, key thing that picked up particularly in relation to GB the idea of developing these multi-species uh, single databases for animal identification and traceability does appear to be challenging. It may be not that surprising given the, the range of, of animals and functions this has to perform. And I suppose I really draw your attention there to I suppose the GB section of the table and the really apparent failure um, within GB to deliver what was a proposed livestock identification and tracing programme. I suppose the reason I draw your attention to that maybe in a way it's maybe pertinent, particularly in relation to moving forward with our own uh, NIFIA system is that uh, livestock identification and tracing programme actually had £136 million spent on it between 2003, 4, 5 and 6. £46 million of that actually being in, in capital investment. Um, there was and there were movements towards a pilot programme in 2006, but that was actually suspended in that year. And I suppose it, it, the, the actual project in that regard is we, we lost all trace of it. We've been unable to find any trace of it since. So I suppose it does maybe raise questions, are there lessons in terms of the challenges posed by these types of systems? And it also highlights the level of investment required and the efforts to actually establish them. I think the, just the other couple of comments I want to make. With all of the systems identified, it's, it's very clear that individual value for money and comparative cost with other systems is difficult to establish. The only actual data that I could find in that regard was the, the Irish AIM system, or AIM system, where there was a, a value for money uh, review conducted, and that concluded, and I quote, that the system provides value for money in terms of cost, efficiency of delivery, and achievement of objectives, and it merits public funding. There is costing data, as you can see, across the table uh, available for a number of the systems, and that does suggest, I suppose, at a very basic level, that there is variation in both setup and running costs. If you take, for example, the Northern Ireland running costs uh, that I've, I've cited there in terms of coming in roughly about £4 million annually, whereas the ROI figure from back, and I think this is again 2005-06, uh, maybe slightly later, even up to 2009 actually, was €1.38 million Euro annually. 
But I would caution members really against comparing these figures. The simple reason being that they, we don't have all of the contextual information to ensure that we're comparing like with like. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm recommending that direct comparison is not something really to engage in. And that, I suppose, really brings me on to my, my final comment and observation. And I think it's, it, it's maybe pertinent again um, moving forward with NIFIUS. And it's, it's this. I think that maybe the emphasis in looking at all the systems is that rather than focusing on the, cost, the question of cost, there might be greater value in ensuring that the maximum benefits are derived from the system that, that each country has, whether that's here or somewhere else. I suppose really what I'm, I'm saying there is how will the data collected from any system be utilised, in our instance by DARD, other parts of government, academia, and I mean, it's, it, particularly in my faces instance, the accompanying leaflet the Department of Publishers that highlights a number of areas that they believe NIFAS will contribute towards, and those are controlling and eradicating particular farm diseases, delivering health programmes for TB, brucellosis, BSE and others, protecting animal welfare, detecting and proper use of medical and growth promoter products, complying with grant schemes, confirming compliance with farm quality scheme conditions, supporting the marketing of animals and animal products and facilitating trade by streamlining imports and exports. So I suppose those are all admirable aims and I suppose the key really for any system is to ensure that it delivers on those. And maybe the question I would postulate is could there be other benefits or applications from my face that could be maybe applicable to other programmes or other departments or other, other uses? That Chair, I suppose, is really at, at this point all I, I want to say. And again, I want to apologise for the fact that uh, this was tabled uh, quite late in the day. Um, but I, I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And certainly, uh, you always do a good paper. So uh, I was aware that you were actually forwarded for award in one of the recent papers you've done. So congratulations on that, too. Thank so you. It is uh, certainly proof that you do an excellent job. Uh, I was just looking at, and I know you did say that you caution the uh, looking at the costs and the rolling costs of of, of, of both different programs in different uh, different uh, areas and different regions. But I was just looking at the Republic. That's 1.38 million euros. So that's mm -hmm. roughly about one million per year to mm -hmm. one million in Northern Ireland. That seems quite a gap. It does, and I think in a headline figure, and I suppose, Chair, where I'm reluctant to comment on is, is yeah, yeah. it's the type of activities that are being conducted in terms of running. Could there be economies of scale with a greater number of cattle? These are questions, I suppose, which in the data that we had, we weren't able really to make definitive assessments on, hence the reason we didn't try. Now, what I would say is if, if there was a, a committee interest in maybe looking at that in greater detail, it could be something we could go back over a longer period and maybe concentrate on or try and unpick some of these. Okay. Um, but I, I agree with you, at a headline level, it does appear to be significantly lower. Well, I'm not sure the cattle numbers in the Republic, but they're much higher than Northern Ireland numbers. Yeah, and, and the other thing I would have to say on that too is that it's important probably we're comparing year with year, and that is one of the challenges in a lot of these data sets I as understand. well. There can be significant gaps uh, in terms of when the data was actually accrued or evaluations were conducted. Okay. Joanne, you want to ask a Yeah, thank you, Chair Mark. Again, great piece of work, uh, as always. Um, I haven't looked at it in detail, as you said, there's only a table, but maybe it's in it, but just initially looking through it. Are there examples of how governments have managed the translation between an existing and a new identification system? You know, basically, are there lessons which the ARD should examine ahead of embarking on APHIS replacement? That's actually it's a, it's a very good point, and that's something that I, I actually initially had wanted to look at, um, and pressure of time, really, to be honest, and wanting to get you something meant that we weren't able to do it. But I am aware that there were a number of the systems we looked at where there had either been upgrades or data transfers, and even um, moving from one database to another, uh, and I suppose really repopulating one with data from another. And there are um, Documentation, I suppose, particularly in a number of the areas that we could probably come back to. That so, at, at this point, I'm maybe not willing to copy or comment on it, but I'm quite happy to go away and have a look at that and come back to you with anything. I just think it would fit very neatly with absolutely the information in terms of our context and yeah. the context of it. So maybe Chair, if Mark could come back with that, it would be certainly useful to see how you know others have managed that transition. No, and that's I think that's definitely okay. happy to do so. That's okay. Joe Byrne. Yeah, uh, Chairman, again, welcome to the presentation. I suppose the question is what system would best meet their needs? And also, would the system be robust and reliable? 
And obviously then there's a question about value for money. What about any of the, G the GB regional systems? Is there one system for GB or does Scotland and Wales and England have different systems and how do they compare with? You know, the, the cattle tracing system, which is one I've emphasised there, is it's a GB system. So it's, it covers all three jurisdictions within GB. Um, and I suppose that's, in terms of, I said, the value for money um, data, that's something that we, we found difficult to actually accrue myself and a number of colleagues. The simple reason being that we couldn't actually um, with the exception of the Irish one, find a, an, an individual report which dealt with that specific issue. And the, the AIM one, the Irish one, what's the cap at the cost of setting it up or not? The AIM one, um, bear with me one minute. Um, I know you have the running costs here. Right? Yeah, the capital costs of developing, uh, which is the forerunner, I suppose, the CMMS and AIM, um, are counted to €19 million. Euro. Okay. Thanks, John. That's enough. Okay, Declan McAleer. Uh, Chair, um, thank you. Well done, Mark, and getting the award. Um, well, we were nominated, we didn't. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but uh, <laughs> we saw he did when we weren't that disappointed. <laughs> I, I, meant, I meant getting nominated for the award. Thank you. No, appreciate that. Thank you. He, um, I wonder, in the context of compiling the research, Mark, um, did you were you able to ascertain what precisely are, are the issues with the current system? It wasn't, to be honest, within the remit of the paper. I suppose the, the remit was really comparatively, and I suppose I, I understand where the committee were coming from was in terms of costs and really key and general features uh, of EFIS and how it compares. And I suppose the general comment I did make is that EFIS is different, I suppose, to many of the systems we looked at in that small sample for the being that it, it actually incorporated more data. I'm talking really more specifically in terms of the the disease data. I mean, there's the likes of Botswana had that as well, but I think from a point of view of how APHIS, what it had with it and how it was being applied, it was quite hard to find a direct comparison right. on the basis of the sample that we looked at. That's, that was it. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. We now move into closed session. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 